in every Tuesday to the Learning with Lowell podcast with me, your host, Lowell, to hear world-class scientists, startup founders, CEOs, and authors, people who you wouldn't normally hear about but are making huge waves all the same. You'll understand them and their work by hearing their passion, laughter, advice, and hearing them, the experts, break down what they're working on so that you can learn, push the boundaries of your knowledge, and understanding. Today, we are joined with Natalia, CEO and founder of Axion Systems. Axion Systems is principally about making space more accessible with the use of microsatellite platforms using their technology, which is a type of ion propulsion system. They have a wide range of advisors and people helping them out, a huge team. I asked them, like, who are they looking for? So if you want to hear specifically what type of people they like to hire from, stick to like the last half of this. But I will tell you right now that they are looking for microfluidics and electronic engineers. So if you have, if you know anyone like that, please, you know, send, send Natalia a message. But in this episode, we get to see like why she formed her startup, when she knew it was right, you know, just like a really good sense of who she is as a person, what she's building, where the passion comes from, and that type of thing. So I think if you want a little case study, a little sample of what it's like to build a, a space propulsion technology startup out in Boston, I think this is it for you. Separate from uh, what you're working on, this is like a question I always like to ask people because like more, more often than not, when, when people learn about someone, it's always just like business side and uh, business facing. So I'm curious, like when you're not running a business or building something that's really amazing, what are you doing? Like what's something that you're like nerd level passionate about? For me, I'm pretty excited about bees. So, but like what, what's your thing? Yeah, um, by nature, I'm just a very curious person. So I'm always learning about a ton of different things, but that kind of means that I go like an inch deep and a mile wide into all sorts of stuff. So uh, I've been taking a class on um, the programming language Go uh, or Go. I'm also, I try to stay up to speed on quantum computing uh, and, you know, seeing where that, where that's going to head. Uh, And then also the kind of neuroscience side of AI, so, you know, what is intelligence or what is consciousness, what are emotions, um, so those are things I like to, to read up on and, and ponder, um, but I'm kind of all across the board. Mm-hmm. Is there a particular way that you learn about those things, or is it just like journal articles and like the New York Times and like news outlets? Uh, I take online classes sometimes. Right now, I'm only taking one on business contracts because I needed that for work. Um, but typically reading books, uh, listening to books. And then I live in, you know, Boston, Cambridge, where the top researchers in in many of these fields live. So I just talk to them and Mm -hmm. um, go to their talks and things like that. Yeah. uh, I was out in Boston a couple months ago and just like a random, like almost unplanned event. I just wanted to see if I liked the area. Um, mm-hmm. there's, there's like tons of stuff going on all the time. I think that's, that's one of the benefits yeah. of the Boston area. So you can be surrounded by people who kind of like encourage you to learn a lot. So like you're, I feel like that's a, a great uh, location to be the type of person who likes to delve in and go wide on things. So, yes, exactly. What was, uh, this is a question I usually ask later, but since we're on the topic, what was the last like good book that you thought like really captured this, uh, the source material really well? So yeah, what's like the last good book? That's kind of a clunky question, but yeah, the last good book you read. Uh, I think it was his name was Jeff Hawkins, and I'll have to check on that. But that one was a lot about what is intelligence, and there was one um, research study he talked about that uh, I think you know some the participants had lost their sight. Uh, and they were able to to somehow, it was a while since I read the story, but they were able to somehow use their tongues to process what was normally, you know, optical sensory input, and they could actually see uh, a picture of, of what was being presented to them. Um, and that just made me realize we have these, you know, lofty, notions of what our our brain is doing and what intelligence is um but really there's there are you know a handful of sensors and then the the neural networks connecting them and so i feel like we're we're getting closer to to kind of cracking that question of what intelligence is but that was um that book had a lot of interesting insights hmm. 
That sounds fascinating. I'm going to have to, I have to pick that up. What was the name again? I'm sorry. Um, I think it was called on, on intelligence. Um, I can picture the cover. It's blue with black and white writing. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff Hawkins, I think. Hmm. That sounds when fascinating. When we fact check me, we can look that up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. The, um, so uh, moving on to the next question I had was, did you, at what point did you know, or did you feel that you were going to be the type of founder that'd be giving TED Talks? And was that ever really a part of your plan? Or was that you saw an opportunity and you started like going into it? I'm just curious, like, when did you know that that was going to be something in, in your future? Or is it, or did you ever see that type of thing coming? No, I never, I never saw that coming. Uh, I did not think I'd start the company. Uh, I always thought I'd have a boss and really now I have like 40 bosses. Uh, but you know, I never, never thought I'd go down this path. Um, but there was, you know, the timing was right and, and the technology was exciting. So here we are. Um, uh, yeah. And then you had, you had the second part of that question too, that I, um, wrote some notes for the best prepared me to lead the company. I don't know if you yeah. wanted to. Go yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, if this makes it into the final item, like uh, I sent some questions ahead of time so we could have some uh, thoughtful uh, conversation around these huge parts. But yeah, what do you think has prepared you to be able to lead a company effectively? Uh, I think three main things. Uh, living through actual leadership experiences, not, not just here, uh, but beforehand, like running a NASA program when I was in grad school or um, being, you know, president of, of a club. Um, and then, and then of course, living through real experiences here at Axion over the past five or seven years, kind of depends on who's counting um, when, when the company started. Um, and then number two would be having strong support from advisors and even a coach and mentors and um, peer groups, just people that can hold a mirror up to, to my performance and, and behavior and outcomes in, in different scenarios and help me think through, you know, where do we go from here? And then the third thing um, is kind of more formal training, like, like books, um, leadership books or management books and, um, doing some like leadership development courses and programs. Hmm. If there was a person who was thinking about building a startup and they had, I don't know, like, let's give them like six months since that's an arbitrary amount of time. So what would you encourage them to either read or be doing to prepare themselves to be in that type of leadership role? Are there books that you, you found to be touchstones for you or um, type of mentors that you think that people should keep an eye out for? I mean, granted it is very dependent on the type of industry they're going to go into but if they have like six months to prepare themselves what do you think they should be doing yeah so two books come to mind um one's called startup ceo by matt blumberg and that i think i've read that three or four times and it's just a playbook of the things you'll encounter in the early stages and ideas for setting up your own approach and processes to them and then another book is a bit um on the softer side as far as it's not you know um tactical strategies but um the hard things about hard things hmm. um uh and that one i've also read that one several times throughout uh axion's life and it changes for me each time like when i read it it's by um, ben horowitz and when i read it the first time he's talking about how you know, at a certain point, you'll feel really lonely and um, have no one to talk to and that sometimes you'll want to throw up or cry or something. And I was like, okay, that's, that's a bit dramatic. I don't think that's ever going to happen. And then I read it, you know, two years later, <laughs> I get it. Um, so <laughs> I keep, I keep rereading that one and it changes for me. So those are two books I would recommend. And then um, I would say as early as possible, find some peer groups because you'll, you know, when, when you get advice or ask for help from anybody for anything in life, you'll end up with, you know, three different mm. bits of advice, um, three different stories. Everybody gives you different advice for the same problem. So 
you have to learn quickly how to kind of take all that and synthesize it and apply it to your own situation. And being a part of peer groups is a really good way to talk through things that you'll run into and, and hear their stories and figure out, you know, what does that mean for you and your company? Hmm. You're talking like other CEOs or, or like a meetup, meetup.com, I think has a bunch, like you can find events where like other people are doing stuff or like, like what type of peer yeah, groups? So- Right. If you're a little bit farther along and have raised money from institutional investors, often they'll have set up groups of other founders or CEOs that they've also invested in. Um, so that that is something I participate in now. But um, if you're much ear- earlier but still looking for, for some sort of um, community to be a part of, I think, yeah, check out meetup.com. Um, you know, probably even people in the nearby university or their entrepreneurship groups popping up all over the place now. Yeah. It's yeah. They're, they're, uh, yeah. For anyone out there, like who feels like they have to like do it in isolation and definitely take that advice and find people to at the very least, like bounce your ideas off of. I think some, I think the, one of the concerns I've heard is that sometimes people feel like people are going to steal your idea and it's like, not not everyone can do what you're going to do. Like the, like the way you're going to execute an idea is like how it, it's unique. Like telling someone your idea and like asking for feedback, or like it's re- like the likelihood that someone's going to steal it is in my experience or like from what I've seen, very, 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 very minimal. I don't know if you uh, feel the same way, but I think that's like one of the reasons that people tend to shy away from being in peer groups, but and I haven't seen yeah. that really the case. Yeah. I feel like people just inherently are, split on that people either guard their stuff or they um are you know collaborators and um people it's just I don't even think it's necessarily specific to their idea or company I think people just have that one mentality or the other but here we're we're very collaborative but there there are times when we have to protect stuff by a trade secret um but I'm definitely a, I'm an over sharer maybe mm-hmm. so one question. One question before I move on to the the next one we had. The um, I'm curious. Before you decided to found it, found your company, was there like a checklist you went through in your head when you said like when you said like okay, I have enough things in place for the to to do this or like how did you know when you were ready? I suppose is is it a real question? Like was there a litmus test? Was there a checklist? Like how did you know when it was appropriate? Uh, yeah, that. That will be different for everybody. Uh, I would say once you officially found, you know, you start opening down your company, you start opening yourself up to additional challenges, like on the founding team, you have to make some decisions that could be premature, um, that maybe you'd rather put off for a little bit. But um, for us and Axion, what happened was we needed to license out the intellectual property from MIT and we needed a legal entity to do that. So we had to found the company. So then that leads to how do you split founder equity, who's doing what role um, and so on. So I know that figuring out when the right time is will be different for, for everybody. Um, But often you just have to because of external circumstances. Hmm. Makes sense though. So I I originally had this question, but I, I found out the answer, but um where does the Axion name come from? I thought it was Wally because it kind of reminded me of the ship, but apparently it is not. So where does it come from? Well, the official story that we tell investors uh, is that uh, it's like, a, we, you know, we build ion engines. Uh, so Axion is like a concatenation of accelerate ion. So that's what we do. Um, but that was just like a convenient after the fact sort of coincidence and really my co-founder Lewis and I were on Google Hangouts chatting about um, we were looking through like lists of star names and Greek gods and things and um, we I ended up in a glossary of Harry Potter spells because we're both big Harry Potter fans and so it's actually the summoning charm um, Hmm. and then we added uh, uh, I'm a I'm a you know book reader more than movie watcher, so I think they pronounce it ASIO. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we added an end to the end of it to make it work with with what we build. Mm-hmm. Do you, Do you have a favorite book of Harry Potter? Um, I think probably the Order of the Phoenix. 
well, it used to be The Prisoner of Azkaban, but I've just read it and watched it too many times that now I have to pick a new favorite. So probably The Order of the Phoenix. Mm, my, my favorite's The uh, Prisoner of Azkaban, I, like, both movie and book. I feel like that's where like the... It's a good one. Yeah, it, like it, the, the series really like tonally shifted after that. It became like... Yeah. Or, or The Phoenix is the same way. It's like another one of those like Keystone books. But... Mm-hmm. So the, the next question I have for you is... so. F- there in in um peter Thiel's zero to one um which is a great book for anyone who's an entrepreneur and wants to uh see how someone like him kind of like breaks down a startup he he one of his criterion is figuring out like why now is the critical moment for something to be successful and so i'm curious how you knew that building this company today well i mean granted like you founded it you know a little bit ago but mm-hmm. um why did you feel that the environment was supportive of axion and then and then what made you feel like this was the right time yeah. Uh, so actually, you know, my co-founder, but at the time he was my lab mate and I were just trying to stay in academia and do research and maybe become faculty one day. And um, we started getting a lot of interest in the technology from big aerospace companies. They were trying to license the patents out of MIT or they were trying to buy full propulsion systems from us, but MIT can't sell things commercially. So we got this early sign that we had a good fit between what we were building and and what the market would need. And the other big sign for us was that um, the industry was undergoing like the first big change since its inception and in the fifties when um, because of kind of a perfect storm of things like Moore's law had meant that, you know, electronics could be built smaller, but still very capable. So you could, take what used to be a school bus size satellite and fit that in something much smaller, like a refrigerator. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was happening. Uh, you had people that wanted to be on the internet, which, um, you know, was not the case uh, 20, 30 years ago when people tried to build small satellites the first time. Uh, and then you also had this new infusion of like wealth and capital from some of these rich you know, billionaires like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk into this industry that were helping flow cash into into the field when the government was actually pulling back funding some of the development. Um, so there were all of these things happening uh, that were driving people towards smaller and smaller satellites and opening up new commercial opportunities. And we saw this big gap in technology capabilities, which was in space propulsion, which was exactly what we were working on. And we started getting all these bites at at MIT. Um, And so, yeah, I think that combination of those factors told us now's the time. Let's spin it out. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So so I know it's not just you at your, your company. I'm curious what, what, what's your team like and what were, what's like the special sauce on that element? Uh, Yeah. So The team, we're about 35 people here and um, probably, I think, 31 technical folks. And then the rest of us are just doing the paperwork, trying to hold the the rest of the glue together. Um, And largely people are not, you know, rocket scientists by background. And um, but generally everybody's very bright and and hardworking, um, usually mechanical or electrical or uh, microfluidics backgrounds, and then we kind of train everyone up in in what we're doing and turn them all into rocket scientists. And you know, our thinking there is we're doing something no one's done before, so we can't expect to find people that have experience in in what we're doing. So we hire for you know just smart, hardworking people and and turn them into rocket scientists. Hmm. A small task. <laughs> the, the, yeah. So, <laughs> yes. So what a what. In terms of your technology, I was reading that ion electrospray is like a key component of it. So as a two-part question, mm-hmm. like, how would you explain what that is to a layman? And then what attracted you to it originally? Yeah, well, I'll answer the second part first. Um, I knew I wanted to work on in-space propulsion um, for a long time. Uh, that has a longer backstory that we could get into, but so I knew I wanted to work on some kind of probably ion engine or, or electric propulsion, but I wanted to work on a new aspect of it. Um, the existing 
electric systems have been around since the 50s and 60s. Um, so I wanted to do, you know, the next thing and I got that opportunity and, you know, here we are. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, what, what we're doing that's different from those existing things, um, so different from anything that can propel a, a spacecraft around in orbit, um, ours is, is extremely simple. Um, so that kind of translate, translates into our systems being lighter and cheaper and, and less complex, more reliable. Um, it, they're also very easy to manufacture in large batches, um, which is a very new concept to the space industry. Mm-hmm. Um, most things in space have, were designed to be built once um, or you know, maybe one per year. Mm-hmm. And then the, the last difference that I'll highlight is that our systems are very modular and, and scalable. So if your mission changes or if, you have, if you're building satellites of multiple sizes, um, you can still just adopt and, and buy one technology and then adapt it to your particular needs. So that's unique as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are the, the differences, but then I could get into how it actually works if you'd like to hear that as well. Yes. Yeah, that sounds fun. Great. Okay. So ion engines, generally speaking, are a type of electric propulsion, uh, which is different from chemical rockets, which are the ones most people think of. And they think of satellite propulsion, um, but <clears throat> in both cases, they they rely on the conservation of momentum. So you have to throw stuff out the back of the spacecraft in order to push it in the opposite direction. Mm-hmm. So chemical rockets, you know, throw they combust gases and throw the products out the back of the nozzle. Electric systems use um, electrical energy to push charged particles out the back. Um, in our case, ions. Uh, And so what we do is we extract ions from a liquid propellant, and we do that using an electric field. It's just, it's DC, it's fairly straightforward. Um, An electric field to extract and accelerate ions from a liquid propellant. Um, And because we use a liquid and not a gas, like other ion engines, we don't need pressure vessels and valves and kind of complex machinery to handle um, a pressurized gas. Uh, and so our systems can be much smaller and simpler for these small satellites, like I mentioned. Mm-hmm. The isn't I think there's a, a there's isn't Voyager run on ion propulsion, or am I thinking of a different satellite? There, I feel like there's a satellite that's going really far away that uses ion propulsion to propel itself. Am I, am I mistaken, or is? Um, yeah, so there there have been several spacecraft that have used ion engines for interplanetary missions. Um, you'd actually be surprised that many of them don't use any propulsion for those maneuvers, but instead they use gravity assist from Jupiter and, and things like that, or at least I was surprised to learn that. Um, but yes, there are certainly ion engines on some NASA and, and other space agency missions to, to other planets. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I think when I was, when I was a young warthog, the, um, that I was reading <laughs> that, that I was reading that, um, that like the, the amount of, propulsion that comes out it's like the like how a piece of paper would feel on your skin so like it's, it's very light but it builds up because like um you're working in yeah a, things can like like on your on your website you have a video of a a fun video of a like a space a space person sitting on one of the satellites throwing cans behind him or her and yeah. uh, like it's like the s- smallest things but like it builds up to get where you need to go it's not like like a like a like the chemical rockets where it's like a big giant flame that like shoots it really fast if I'm, if I'm, like, remember yeah, I'm so, yeah, so let's take the electric and chemical systems. If you look at how much thrust they produce over time, you can end up talking about similar numbers. It's just how fast that thrust comes out um, at any given instant in time. So mm-hmm. chemical rockets deliver a ton of thrust very quickly, which you need to be able to you know, launch and and things like that. Um, Electric systems are typically much lower thrust amounts, but if you integrate that over time, you can still accelerate a spacecraft pretty to a pretty high speed. You just have to have the time available. Mm -hmm. And and the reason, the reason you would make that trade off is because um, you can actually do it much more efficiently electrically. So you need much less fuel. It just takes longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like the, the Voyager one, I think, (laughs) 
it was a combination of ion and gravity assist, but now it's going like the fastest any mm-hmm. human made thing has ever gone. So like, even mm-hmm. though it's like, like started out slow, now exactly. it's, going, it's going like, I think, isn't it like a, I, don't, I doubt either of us know the actual number, but I think it's going like a, like a hundred thousand miles a second. I don't know. It's like a really, 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 really fast. Yeah. Know. Yeah. I don't know the top of my head either, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it builds up. The, so what is, mm-hmm. what is something that you think people get wrong or mistaken about what you're building? So when you're like, when you talk to the general population or when you get featured on TED Talks and then you get people's feedback, what do you think people get mistaken more often about? Yeah, uh, this one was easy for me to think of actually, uh, that we are a company just building propulsion for CubeSats. Um, So the shoebox size satellites and certainly it's um, simpler for us to start out small and that's those are the kinds of satellites that some of our first customers are launching. Um, but the technology, the ion electro spray is incredibly scalable. Um, and we see the path to building systems for even big geostationary satellites and, and these interplanetary missions uh, in the, the not so distant future. So we're, we're very excited for what CubeSats are enabling in the you know, technology demonstrations and kind of on the university science side of things um but we're also working really hard in lab on bigger and bigger systems do you have a like if you look like i don't know like five or ten years in the future is there an application that you're excited to see being in practice yeah um one that at least to me still sounds totally like science fiction but that is starting to be become more of a reality which is um, in orbit servicing and you know proximity operations having a spacecraft or a satellite approach another satellite um, we've done you know some proximity operations at the space station and so on when we're docking and, and things like that um, but doing that on the the commercial satellite side is really exciting and you know refueling a satellite or um, doing repairs or things like that and the reason I think that's exciting first because it's something at Axion that we can hopefully be a big part of because our propellant's really um, safe and unpressurized. So it'd be really easy to go up and refuel another satellite in that mm-hmm. scenario. But the other reason it's really exciting is because it feels like a pretty big step on the path to you know humans living and spending more time in space and just increasing our capabilities there. So I've got my eye on on advances in that area. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. The, so, okay, wait, some popped up. I'll ignore that. The, I don't know. There's a, a pop-up. That's weird. All right. I'll, I'll have to, all right. It's being a goofball. I'll ignore. Uh, there's like a, I don't know if you saw this, but there's like a bunch of pop-ups. That I did. Like, yeah. <laughs> okay. I was like, what are you, what are you doing? Zoom? You've never done this to me. I'll mark the time the, uh, to rip this out. So, all right. Uh, definitely a question I was curious about because I'm always like one of the points of the podcast is to, like talk about the amazing scientists, learn more about you uh, and the science and the scientists um, building great things, but at the same time, see what the listeners can do to help people out. So I'm curious, is there something that you're either struggling with or that you're going to be looking to solve in the future that a listener could be, that could be mindful of and then be like, Oh, I can help with that. Like I know someone who knows marketing. Oh, I could send that, that person to them. Or I know someone who knows how to make graphic images or video, you know, anything in the world that you're in regards to what you're building that you're struggling with currently that you'd love help with? Yes, always. Um, I have a list of things uh, and usually related to hiring people in these areas or um, we're building out our scientific advisory board. Um, So in whatever capacity uh, we we're always looking for support in um, on the test side. So we test really small things in vacuum chambers. Um, So we're always looking for advances in like in situ imaging of, you know, micron scale fluid features in vacuum, mm-hmm. uh, which is not our core thing that we need to be really good at. So we're looking to, to add people to the team that can help with that. Um, and then ion electrospray for us has turned out to be more of a, a material than nano fabrication uh, adventure than than we ever planned on. Um, it's not just pure 
you know, rocket science. It's a very interdisciplinary problem. So um, we're always looking to improve our capabilities in those areas. So definitely hiring um, all of our open positions are on the website, but also, like I said, um, building out our its scientific advisory board, particular, particularly in those areas. Do you have any uh, like dream people you'd love on your board? <laughs> Maybe they will be listening. Yeah, um, a, a lot around microfluidics and like surface energies and nano coatings. Um, that's been a, a tough one for us. So yeah, that. So anyone who knows in that, that area. Stuff. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right, sweet. Then um, the last little bit we have are just kind of like these uh, like quick questions. Um, yeah. So the, the first one is, and I think you, we kind of touched on this in the beginning, but I'll, as someone, I kind of get the sense that you're kind of a lifelong learner. So I'm, I'm curious, like, how do mm-hmm. you continually push yourself to be a better leader? Is there like um, avenues that you found to be effective mm-hmm. in, in pushing yourself? Or, or even if you could give like an example of like how you've had to level yourself up, like anything that would help someone understand like how to uh, push themselves to be a great leader, like you're, you're trying to do. Yeah. Um kind of the same way I approach, you know, learning anything, reading books, but also talking to people. So I just needed to learn how to level up R&D at at Axion. And um, I wrote a post on that, so I won't get into it here, but I went out and talked to, you know, 10 people that had done that well in their careers. But I would also say um, be really self-reflective too, and, you know, help yourself by figuring out where you could improve and, and then figure out how to do that. So maybe keep a journal. Mm-hmm. So I think I heard Elon Musk say once that he actively seeks out people who disagree with him or that will give him negative feedback. Is that something that you found to, to be effective as well? Or as like, like a, a way to ensure that you're, you're getting an honest appraisal of how things are going? Um, yeah, I mean, I, think like sometimes you may have actually done something quite well so maybe you don't always need to keep searching till you find someone negative but asking enough people and getting enough different perspectives and making sure you are getting honest feedback is is really important Mm -hmm. so if you if you had to change one thing about the company uh which probably be more like people to help out with microfluidics (laughs) uh, what would it be i put two things um i would love to put in nap pods um and then i would also i wish that we were closer to cambridge and and mit we're in charlestown which is great but i would really love to you know be able to walk over and pop into the labs that we use and and so on at mit yeah the what have you learned this year that will be i mean granted we're still pretty pretty early into the year but like what will yeah so I, I'll like modify the question a little bit. Like what have you learned so far this year that's really going to change how the rest of the year goes? Yeah, well, and I actually have a good answer, except I can't share all the details, but we've just recently made some really fantastic technology breakthroughs that we've been working towards for longer than I care to admit. And um, I can't share just yet, but um, I think those mean that the rest of this this year will look really different for Axion and um, the next phase. And, and I've got to hold on to my shorts because we're going to be changing a lot around here. Mm-hmm. Is there, I imagine the, the website's a pretty good place to keep current with those types of developments that are coming out. Um, this isn't like the next mm-hmm. question, but uh, I'm curious, are, is there a yeah. really good way for people who want to be like not missing out to make sure that they're getting everything? Yeah, I think we do a good job of the posting those types of things on Twitter. Okay, yeah. Yeah, Twitter seems to be the way to do it. Like, uh, like people are, that was one of the things that I was surprised by when I first started talking to, like, more and more people. That yeah. How often, like, Twitter is, like, a very effective way to learn about, like, really, like, far-reaching advances. Um, right. Which, yeah. So, anyone interested in learning about science, like, really, like, type in those sections in, like, the, the feed and you'll probably find people. But definitely, like, follow theirs. I'll, mm-hmm. I'll include links in the show notes but if you could point out one thing that you're proud of about your company what would it be like i'm sure there's lots of stuff because i mean it's kind of like your baby but um what's something that you're Mm -hmm. particularly proud of uh i would say the culture uh it always continues to to surprise me in a good way but we have a really like respectful team and everybody's incredibly smart and, and sometimes we hear that we can be a bit intimidating but 
um, and everybody's really hardworking, but we've just maintained this great environment of like respect and, and people seem to work really well together. So um, it's a challenging balance, I think. And, and I think we do that well. Yeah. So I, I am always curious to learn how people like, like what people's days actually consist of. So like, how would, what, what is like, if there is such thing as an average day, like what are some of the things that you accomplish in a given day? Like how does like the structure of it work? Sure. Uh, so each month I, I identify my top three priorities for the month based on kind of have this series of questions I run through and figure out where I need to be spending my time. So every day I try to spend like 50 to 75% of my day on those. And then the rest is, you know, with the team, um, doing email, doing podcast interviews, um, going to, to conferences and, and other things that come up. Hmm. Is it, do the questions that you ask yourself, do they basically, do they summarize down to being what's important versus what's urgent or like what, what, how would you describe them? Um, yeah, well, it's a list of the important things. So it helps me kind of filter past just the urgent things. Yeah. Um, but often, you know, things are important and urgent and those, those come up through these questions as well. Mm -hmm. so, so this is a question I've been enjoying asking people. Uh, what is a, what is a question that you do not have the answer to? that you wish you had the answer to. Mm -hmm. um, my, the, the kind of the example I give is that, so if the Big Bang has like a causational relationship with the universe existing as it exists today, if you were to go back and like stop that from happening, what would exist here with, you know, in its stead, like what would be here? And then if, if, if you were like, go before the Big Bang, like what was there beforehand? Like the, the, I've been trying to talk to more physicists about this because it, it's, it's an interesting question. Because like it is, you know, it does seem causationally related. So I'm curious, like how would you, like how things would change if you took it out of the equation? But like, yes, yeah, so what, it doesn't have to be like that. It could be like, why do, I don't know, why do rats run left? I don't know. Or like, why do crabs crab walk? I don't know. It could be anything. But what's, what's a question that you don't have the answer to that you wonder about? Well, I actually have a lot of questions like the one you just said. So one thing I think about more than I should maybe is um, if, let's say for a minute that there was no beginning of time, mm -hmm. um, then what would that mean about life, our lives? And I don't, I'm going to use the word soul just for lack of a better word. Um, but when we die, wouldn't that mean that something has to carry on? Because if on the, the bigger scale, there was no beginning or end of time, how could there really be on even the more granular scale? So sometimes I ponder that. Um, another question is, um, I, I wonder if our emotions are just like flukes in our wiring and if they're not really necessary, like creativity could just be a, a random variation in um, normal thought processes and so on but we value it a lot um, and so we tend to think that it's some skill we have um, but those are a couple mm -hmm. the one I wrote down because I until you said yours I thought we were going to be much more on the day-to-day -day business focus was um, our annual performance reviews a necessary evil or just evil <laughs> okay that's uh all three good ones. The yeah. The time one. I'm gonna wonder about that now. I have to. I'm gonna go for a walk in like 30 minutes, and um, I like to like walk and think about things, and so that's gonna be one. Yeah. I'm gonna now. So thank you for that. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, you're welcome. Yeah. Uh, so we kind of talked about this a little bit. So what are the places that people can learn more about? Like, what's your Twitter handle and the website name, so people who are just listening can can type it in later? Because some some people drive yeah. and listen. Not listen. Our our website is uh, axion-systems.com and our Twitter handle is axion systems, no dash. And then um, those are the, the two main places people should head. Sweet. So as a party message, do you have a favorite quote you like to leave people with? Uh, it does not do to dwell on dreams and forget to live. Hmm. 
who said that? The Albus Dumbledore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, uh, that, yeah, that makes sense if uh, you really like Harry Potter. And that was Natalia, CEO and founder of Axion Systems. Like I said in the beginning, their big goal, their big mission, their big technology is about making ion propulsion technology for microsatellites. If you like this type of idea of microsatellites and that type of thing, you might enjoy some of the episodes I've done with uh, other space tech companies such as Jim Cantrell, who has built Vector Launch. Thank you for staying around today, and I will cue you out with my outro. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. We can be found on Twitter at Lowell this year, Facebook, and on the website, learningwithlowell.com. Also sign up for the newsletter where you can hear amazing content every Monday, new episodes every Tuesday, and new blog posts around every Thursday. Remember to share and tell your friends. Please and thank you.